There is little doubt that Western culture is under assault, but why and by whom? Catholic League President Bill Donahue is here to tell us and share his new book, Cultural Meltdown. Award-winning TV host, podcaster, and producer Mike Rowe is here to talk about his new film, Something to Stand For, about the often untold stories of heroic Americans. Finally, we remember the life and legacy of peace activist and poet Matty Stepanek with his mom, Jenny. The World Over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me an X post. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover tonight. But first, Louisiana becomes the first U.S. state to require that the Ten Commandments be displayed in all public school classrooms, from kindergarten through state supported colleges and universities. Republican Governor Jeff Landry signed the legislation into law this week and had this to say. This bill mandates the display of the Ten Commandments in every classroom in public, elementary, secondary, and post-education schools in the state of Louisiana. <laughs> because if you want to respect the rule of law, you got to start from the original lawgiver, which was Moses. The poster-sized display of the Ten Commandments with a four-paragraph context statement must be in place in all public classrooms by 2025. Proponents say the law is not solely religious, but rooted in historical context. Opponents question the constitutionality of the legislation and are vowing to challenge it in court. And the Vatican's doctrinal office is charging former papal nuncio to the United States, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, with the alleged crime of schism. Vigano originally posted the accusations on X Thursday, June 20th, saying the DDF informed him with a simple email that he's charged with schism, denial of the legitimacy of Francis's papacy, and rejection of Vatican II. If convicted, he could be excommunicated and possibly removed from the clerical state. Archbishop Vigano has been making headlines for years and is perhaps best known for publicizing the Vatileak scandal, accusing the Pope and hierarchy of covering up abuse allegations against Theodore McCarrick and once calling for Francis's resignation. Details are still coming in, and we will continue to monitor this story in the days to come. <laughs> There is no disputing that we have witnessed a cultural decline in the West. Our manners, our art, morality have all crumbled before our eyes. The president of the Catholic League, Bill Donahue, believes he knows why. The sociologist has written a new book identifying the reasons for the decline. It's called Cultural Meltdown, the Secular Roots of Our Moral Crisis. And Bill Donahue joins me on set. Thank Bill, you so much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in recent polls, and you mentioned this in the book, 54% of Americans say, our moral values are poor, and 83% say they're getting poorer. My question is, how did we get here? Well, we got here because I think beginning in the 1960s, we saw the, the culture shift left. And by that, I mean became more and more secular. The divide today, and it's, this is true in any poll that you look at, whether it's Pew Research, Gallup, doesn't make any difference. They all, they all say that there's a profound difference between those people who accept a religious vision of man and society, which means belief in God, belief in truth, belief in human nature, belief in moral absolutes, and belief in original sin. That's about half the country. Then you have the other half of the country, which says there's no such thing as God. Truth is a fiction. Um, there's no such thing as original sin. We can have perfectibility on, on, on earth today. And of course, they're moral relativists. There's no such thing as a moral absolute. These are two irreconcilable visions of society. And one eventually will triumph over the other. Right now, I see some positive signs for us. I also see some negative signs. But I'm saying one thing as a sociologist. There's no such thing as an iron law of history. Anybody who thinks this is not reversible is crazy. To take one example, the whole insane idea that a man who thinks he's a woman is therefore a woman. 
That's simply not true. Now, everybody really knows that, but it's interesting if you take a look at the, the data on this. But the point is that we are winning in Europe on this. They realize that this is insanity. We now have 18 organizations in this country, medical and pediatric organizations, led proudly by Catholics, which say we've got to stop this, stop the sex reassignment surgery. So there are some important things that are happening. Uh, and unfortunately, as I've said so many times, wherever you find well-educated white people, you have a problem. No, just take a look at the transgender thing. They don't believe this in Latin America. They don't believe this in Africa. They don't believe this in the Middle East. They don't believe it in Asia. So where do they believe it? In Europe, the United States, Canada, and New Zealand, and Australia? And it's the most well-educated people with the postdoctoral degrees who believe it. Blacks are smarter than white people. They are the least likely to believe that a man can become a woman and vice versa. And amongst whites, it's not the fireman's daughter who thinks she's a boy who's transitioning. 80% of the ones transitioning are girls. It's the ones with the postgraduate degrees, the white boys and girls who are super liberal, who have no belief in God, everything is malleable, and they are screwing up their own kids. It's a, it's a major, major problem. Okay, I wanna talk also about the targeting, which we've seen and covered in recent days, of Catholics, particularly traditional ones, by the FBI. And there are a slew of pro-life activists now facing long jail sentences in federal penitentiaries because of the actions they took in Washington, D.C. As I read your book, it's hard to miss the connection between those actions and the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that the, the, the spirit of the Enlightenment, how that has touched our own age and created and driven these acts. The best of the Enlightenment back in the 18th century believed that we, we have to give more attention to the faculty of reason, and that's fine. But we as Catholics understand that reason has to be coupled with faith, and that's where they went off the charts. And you have a number of these uh, Enlightenment writers, Voltaire among them, who hated the Catholic Church, and they felt that they had the power now, this cognitive ability, to take over. They could map out the good society. They could create, they don't believe in original sin, of course, that's, that's for, for Christians to believe in. So they're going to create a better society. It's all malleable. Marx believed that after the Enlightenment and, and Rousseau, of course, before him. This idea that we can create perfection on earth, this is madness. And not only is it false, Raymond, it's dangerous. In history, we've seen this. The, the, if, we, if we are Christians, we understand there are, are limitations to the Christian, to the human condition. We can make progress, to be sure. But the idea of perfection doesn't exist here. And the only redemption is through Jesus Christ. It does, it's not going to come through the state or some, some enlightenment idea. There is an obsession. I mean, you touched on it earlier. There's an obsession in the West with individualism. And we see, which on the surface, look, it sounds like freedom and liberty, that mm -hmm. you protect those individual rights. But in the book, you take issue with John Stuart Mills yeah. and his conception of liberty. He wrote the famous tract on liberty. But, Why? Why do you take exception. I, I thought he was a brilliant philosopher, but when he wrote that essay on liberty in 1859, there were no limits. There were, there, there, were, there were no limits to this idea. The idea that we can all walk around with our own idea of morality without limits, it, it's simply sociologically illiterate. A society is based on a moral consensus. We don't have to agree on everything. It's, we're not talking about unanimity, but there has to be a consensus. Now, the Judeo-Christian ethos and our tradition tells us what the, what the moral code should be, beginning with the Ten Commandments, and of course we have the teachings of the Catholic Church. But if you think that I am just at my own self, I can go about making my own reality, that's what Justice Kennedy said in, the, in that infamous decision when we can all make up our own idea of the mystery of life and of the universe and, and existence. I don't know where he was We're coming self -determining. from. self-determining. We yeah. can determine our own, now, now, who we are yeah. and our place. In now, you, 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 radical individualism Radical libertarianism doesn't work. You have to have a stop sign at some point. And people have to understand that we have to agree to work together in a society. But, but it's not say, just about me. What do you say to people who say to you, mm -hmm. look, I'm not hurting you, Bill Donahue. This is my body. This is my home. Mm -hmm. This is the people I choose to love. This is, my, this is the way I'm going to live my life. This has no bearing on you. It's frankly none of your business, Bill Donahue. But it is my business because if a masochist hires a sadist, and they want to be beaten to death at noon uh, on Main Street, and they want to put it on TV for pay-per-view, 
that does affect the rest of us it, because we, it coarsens our society. You know, they I say that reason is the only thing that matters and consent, that's all that matters. Oh, really? So if a mother and son want to have sex, that's okay? Do these people ever think anything through? Reason is important. But, you know, if consent, well, you can legalize bribery for that matter. There's nothing you can't do. It It all comes back to the idea that you can't just, this idea of radical autonomy, as they say, in sociologically illiterate, you've got to live in a society with a moral code. And if you don't want the Judeo-Christian code, I'm going to ask you, what one do you want to put in its place? Well, the question is, can this experiment, this experiment in liberty, which is how all those founders defined it, mm -hmm. the, Madison and Hamilton and Franklin, they all, in various ways, Sam Adams, they all describe this experiment as only being held up by a moral people, because you can't have an immoral people right. voting, because then the universe becomes goes sideways. You're voting against reality if you can't see it the way... It, it should be seen in the way it's rooted in, in natural law. Can this experiment in liberty survive any more people? No, it cannot. And, and that's just it. If, if secularism triumphs in its radical manifestation, we cannot. But, and, and the worst of it is, is postmodernism. The idea that, 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 that uh, truth is, is, uh, is, not, is, is a fiction. Uh, you, this, you, this is insane. You mention in the book Justice Warren, of all people, yeah. uh, who writes... We have an obligation to protect a decent yeah. society. Right. How do you balance that with these individual rights? And have we forgotten that notion of a decent society? The, the, well, we have forgotten the notion of a decent society. We have forgotten the idea of how we society can't agree even operates. What it is. We can't agree what it is. Exactly. But, but you wind up with an atomized situation. You want what sociologists call anomie, which is just another way of saying normlessness, that there's no such thing as right and wrong. I have a segment in the book there, Raymond, and I know you've read it, about the Weimar Republic. We're oh, yeah. talking about... I'm going to get to that. Okay, go, go, go. go. I'm going to get to that. Sure, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting... Because uh, that, that's about how cultures fall, which yeah, I'm going to exactly. get to in a minute. But before that, you mentioned the Ten Commandments. Okay. Now, this is this is really the bedrock. You go down to the Supreme Court, which are just two blocks but, from here, three blocks from here, you'll see Moses up there. The Ten Commandments, and you cite them here as the root of all the law, mm -hmm. the law that we, we have in the United States and elsewhere. But we've overthrown the top three of those commandments. Right. You shall have no false gods before me. Don't take God's name in vain. Keep holy the Sabbath day, the Lord's day. How do you retain everything that follows when there's no agreement? In fact, there's disagreement over those first three. Right, because then you come down to everything a matter of personal opinion. So if you want to own a slave, that's your business, and, uh, and that's not, not my business. Honor thy father and thy mother is a commandment. And, that, and that's not something that is a matter of a personal opinion. Everybody's entitled to his own personal opinion. But when it comes to morality, you can't have a society where everybody walks around with his own idea about what is right and wrong. That actually works against the least among us. The, the least powerful people in society always, always lose hysteric, historically when you have the idea that we're going to make up our own mind. Because the ones who are in charge will make up their own mind, and you're going to follow exactly what they have to say. They're not going to consent with you. Where does the church, does the church have responsibility in some of this, in that the moral voice has been blunted or excised to such a degree or self-edited to such a degree that it becomes meaningful? The Catholic Church has not spoken up the way it should. Quite frankly, too many priests have been intimidated, including bishops as well, uh, because we had the scandal. That scandal was 1965 to 1985, and I've written a book about it, and, and, and lately the latest statistics is practically nothing. That's long over. Don't let the media hang this on you. The whole idea is to silence us. I mean, you think that these people were pushing for incest and it, the major scholars that I put in the book, do you think they care about child abuse? They're in favor of it. And, they, and I cite it in the book and how many of these people have throughout history done this. So the, the voice of the Catholic Church is there. If some of the teachers failed us, it's because they didn't follow the teachings, namely the priest. But if we don't speak up along with evangelicals and Orthodox Jews and some Muslims and Mormons, we have more in common together than some people who are in the secular vein. They may even say they're, they're, they identify as a Catholic, but uh, in, in terms of their vision of man and society, they're on the secular side. There's a fascinating thing happening in the physical realm, and that is the destruction, the burning, and the desecration of churches. Good. This is happening around the world. 
in Canada just this week. They torched a church, not a Catholic one. In Ireland, a migrant went in and burned the bodies that were reposed there, including that of a crusader. Where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? The whole, the whole idea goes back to Marx and, and even before him. If you, if you believe that, that the state is the answer, that we can reshape society and create a utopia, then you have to get rid of the past. If you're going to get rid of the past, then you have to do what? You have to tackle the family and you have to ta tackle religion. Why? Because that's where people set anchor. That's, that, that's the basis of traditionalism. That's why they attack it. Look, when Mao took over in 1949 in China, what's the, one of the first things they did? They bulldozed the, 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 the ancestors. They want to destroy the past. That's what they're doing now. This is right out of Huxley and, and, and Orwell. They want to destroy the past so they can create, create a future. And every time they try, they fail. I saw a hideous bit of video this week in China. There's a law that says you can't have above ground burial of ancestors. Yeah, yeah. So they're making them not only disinter all of these ancestors, but destroy these above ground cemeteries. Beautiful, ornate above ground cemeteries with their, you know, marking their, their people in the Chinese tradition. They're demolishing that because it speaks of a time that precedes communism. They don't want those markers. And there's a difference between authoritarian regimes like Franco. He didn't care what you thought. He just simply said, I rule, I'm making all the decisions. And the totalitarian people, they're concerned about your, what's in your head. They're concerned about your mind. That's thought control. So what do you attribute the rise, and you mentioned this in the book, Cultural Meltdown, the rise in the demonic that we're seeing, not only in the pop culture, possessions are up, We've seen horrific crimes against individuals like we've never seen before. Beheadings and, and horrible mutilations. Where is the alternative? Where is the defense against this spirit, if you will? Well, this di di diabolical spirit. This does come out of the whole idea of radical autonomy. I don't want to be told. As I've said many times, the three most dreaded words in the, in the English language are thou shalt not. Don't tell me what I can do with myself, my body. With, with, with. Look. This is insanity. You, you, you've got to live together in a society with the moral consensus. The Judeo-Christian ethos worked very, very well. And today we're dissembling it. And with this idea of sexual free-for-all, we're, we're, we are actually celebrating people like Kinsey, who had sex with, with kids who, ju who justified everything and, and incest. And like, he's a hero at Indiana University. They have a big sculpture of him uh, there. I mean, people need to read about the people who are pushing this sexual agenda they themselves are dysfunctional in their own personal life. And you go back and look at this. Marx fathered kids, never, never supported them. Rousseau fathered five kids, never supported, never gave them a name. You can go right down the list of the, the people today. They believe that we should get rid of the laws uh, between having uh, adults having sex with children. There are organizations like b 4 act which believe that we should call them minor attracted persons. We, we don't want to stigmatize people. It's all coming from the left, and it all goes back against God. They're in rebellion against God. They don't want to be told that you need to put the brakes on your, li on your uh, libido, or what Freud called the id, your pleasure principle. You better put the brakes on them, because otherwise you're going to wind up with moral destitution. You did a poll. McLaughlin did a poll for but, you and associates, where you looked at Catholics, and you found those, from those who, of those who don't go to Mass anymore, 78% considered their faith important to them. How do you reach those people? And has the church done a good enough job in trying to reach them? No, I don't think they have. And, I, and quite frankly, I do know people personally who don't go to church on a regular basis. Uh, they're still proud to be Catholic. I mean, that, that's a different group than the people who left the church and who were angry at the church. There are a lot of different groups out there. We need to reach out to those people who are somewhat alienated, disaffected, or in some cases just plain lazy, but they're not in rebellion against us. We can do more to bring back them, and, and, and I think some of the, the schools can do a good job. Alumni bringing back to parties and whatnot. People, a lot of us went to Catholic schools, but some of them have, have migrated away. Now, the Catholic Church needs to become bolder about this. We don't have the kind of John O'Connor uh, type of person who kind of led the country on this, you know? The, the people have been beaten down and intimidated. I think that's wrong. You've been through a lot. I've been through a lot as, as lay Catholic leaders. And the viciousness, we, don't, we, we could talk about that for another hour. But you've got to step up. I mean, you've got to have thick, thick skin. 
and 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 either that or the other side's going to win. And and uh, I'll be damned if I if I'm going to let sit back and just watch on TV the other side win. Mm. I, I want to talk for a moment about what I consider some of the most disturbing news in the United States, and it's connected to this falling away of faith, and that is birth rates down below replacement level for the first time in the United States. But this is epidemic throughout the West. And on top of that, marriage down. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you about the people themselves? And does it bespeak a lack of belief in not only their country and their people, but in their future? I think it has a lot to do with that. But I have to say, in fairness here, there are a lot of young people who the economy has been destroyed in many respects. And what, what's happened in inflation over the last several years, kids want to have families. Some of them do. And they can't afford to. I mean, it, we, 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 we've made it economically problematic. We need to come up with some so, uh, some public policies to make it easier for them. But yes, then there's the whole idea of the narcissism. I want to do what I want with my body. You went back to it. You said yeah. You said earlier, yeah. when individualism is prized, right. they want you to be individualized. Right. In your little cubicle in a right. city, in an apartment, no car, no no no, no loved ones. You can have sex with a throuple, mm -hmm. but don't have with, with just one person you're committed to. This, there's something at play here where you, you mentioned the word earlier, atomizing people, mm -hmm. where you separate and atomize. That does concern me, though, because to me it says, I don't have any belief in the future. I don't want to have kids. I don't want to bring them into this world, and I don't think I'm confident enough to raise them. That's where we have this divide, because the, the people who do have the religious vision are continuing to have the children. So if you take a look at the Jewish community, those who are the secular Jews tend to have the, the smallest birth rate. But take a look at the Orthodox Jews. They're having, they're, they're, they don't have a problem with it there. So there are some good things happening in that sense. But that, you know, how do you get this? It, it basically, how do you defeat the secularism? And, and that's what this is all about. You've got to, in some cases, like the, the situation with the transgender, you just have to keep at it. And I think we're winning. I think we're selling. I think this is going to triumph. But here we have a problem. The elites at the top, the American Medical Association and others, the Biden administration, they believe that a man can become a woman and vice versa. The average person knows that that's nonsense. It's, it's, the masses at the bottom are going to have to educate the ones at the top and not look to them for leadership. I was fascinated in the book, In Cultural Meltdown, you talk about how cultures die. And you dive deeply into Rome and the Weimar Republic. What are the telltale signs in their fall? And do you see any tremors in our own culture? Well, I, I sp particularly one after we know that there's been a, a as I a quote, a Bishop Pop Rocky talked about a, a second revolution, sexual revolution, which was the Christian revolution in the first century. He was on with you about this. Uh, and that means that you have to have sexual reticence and you have to put the brakes on as opposed to the hedonism that existed under Rome. But particularly, I wanted to drive the point about the Weimar Republic after World War I up to the time Hitler came in in, in 1933. We know that there were political and economic reasons and wanted the, the Treaty of Versailles, the stab in the back, the depression, inflation. But there was a cultural collapse, a moral collapse in Germany in the 1920s that is stunning of what happened. Why? Well, again, the, the, the whole I, they, their, their attitude was back then, we've suffered so much, the German people, we're entitled to a good time. That's, that was actually what they said back then. So let's throw off these the... the the shades of tradition and morality and the church and, and, and express ourselves. We had the roaring 20s in this country, went way much beyond that over there. And you had people having sex in the streets. It was That, that was the beginning of transgender as the first institute was back over there. My point is this. If, if nothing matters, if everything's just a matter of opinion, then when Hitler comes along, to some he's going to say, I'm the great purifier, but the others have become morally numb. They just, that's what anomie means. It means that, well, you know, I may not approve of it, but who am I to say kind of thing? And that's what happens. You know, they ask Albert Speer, second in command to Hitler, how could you kill all these Jews? He said, I didn't hate them. And he didn't. He said, I depersonalized them. I didn't regard them as human beings. And what, in other words, you are just there as a toy, as a ploy. Uh, I don't have to worry about you. And this is a dangerous situation when you have a situation where people don't regard other people as human blood and flesh, that you need to respect them. And it's, it's very dangerous. I want your reaction to some news. You saw the papal meeting last week with Stephen Colbert, Jimmy Fallon, 
uh, the Jim Gaffigan, Whoopi Goldberg, uh, Chris Rock, and others. The Vatican says this is a way to establish a link between the Vatican and the world of comedy, and they're celebrating the unity in of human diversity. Your reaction, first of all, to that idea, and secondly, what did you make of that invite letter? Well, I, I don't have any problem with, with reaching out to the people in the culture. We shouldn't be a cocoon. We're not the Amish. On the other hand, if we're going to reach out to people and who are, who are the comedians, that's fine. Jim Gaffin, others were there. Jerry Seinfeld would have been a good fight, guy to come in. Uh, but when you bring in people who, and I've documented this, have spoken in the most vile, vicious, obscene way about this pope, as well as other popes, and the Catholic Church, I begin to wonder, is anybody vetting this? Whoopi Goldberg has had six or seven abortions. That's what she has said. She's not sure. I guess when you get to that number, you, you, you kind of lose count. Why are people like that being invited in, and traditional Catholics who like the Latin Mass are being denigrated in, in the Vatican? I mean, you were sending a message, which I think uh, the average practicing Catholic, the ones who paid the bills and go to church on Sunday, are probably wondering, this is crazy. I have fought against these dissidents for years. When I find out that New Ways Ministry and others are being invited in to meet with the Pope, I'm saying, wait a minute, whose side are these people on? Don't you get it? They hate everything about the Catholic Church. And, and yet you want to be friends. There's this misplaced compassion. You know, I mean, if people say I hate you, then you don't need to have it sent in the mail overnight. You should just know it. Why did you write this book, Bill? Why did you write it now? Is this a caution? Is this a warning? What was what what drove you to say, I'm going to sit down, because I know this has to take you some time. Well, the reason I wrote it primarily is because I think the average person knows in his gut there's something wrong going on in our country, but I don't quite get it. I The, the word I always use in writing that I love is clarity. I'm not going to obfuscate. This is easily to understand it's, it's there for the layman. I'm not writing for other PhD sociologists and, and, and the like. I want people to understand that if you're a, a, an intelligent person and this is confusing to you, you'll begin to see this, the origins of it, how it unfolded, and what we can do about it. How is this book different from Secular Sabotage? Well, Secular Sabotage, I think I focus more about war stories than what I was doing in the Catholic League. This is a really basically a statement of where our culture is at in the West in 2024. Personal question before we... Sure. End. Why do you continue to do this all these years later? To write? You know, I know how hard it is to write. These are not... And you write your own books. Yes, I do. Unlike you a lot of people. Yeah, not, yeah. there are a lot of people particularly yeah, we in know. media space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ghost write, everybody, right. There are more ghosts yeah. around them than a right. clairvoyant. Right. But you write your own books. I know the time this takes while you're doing the day job. Why do you continue to do this and continue to fight in this way in the middle of the culture day in and day out? You know, I, I could have retired a number of years ago, but quite frankly, every time I read some, some moral outrage, I just there's something in my gut that says, that's simply wrong, and I have the background, and I'm going to tackle it. If the day comes when I feel like, eh, so what, then I would retire. But it doesn't seem to be happening, quite frankly, and I don't understand. I'm writing faster now than I ever have in my life. So uh, there are some people who are, don't, who are working not too far from here, having a hard time stringing two words together, and uh, they don't know Tuesday from Thursday. I'm only a couple of years younger than that guy. It's not age, people. There's something else going on. Okay, I'm not even going to ask you who you're talking about. We'll well, is it about it Catholic? Okay, Cultural Meltdown, The Secular Roots of Our Moral Crisis by Catholic League President Bill Donahue is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Bill Donahue, thank you. For thank you so much. Great to see you. <laughs> The cultural malaise we mentioned earlier certainly shows up in how Americans currently perceive their own country. A recent Gallup poll shows that 39% of Americans view themselves as intensely patriotic, compared with 71% back in 1998. How has this shift affected America and Americans who are divided culturally and politically as never before. Here with some observations and perhaps a restorative is the Emmy winning TV host, podcaster and best selling author, writer and producer of a wonderful new film, Something to Stand For. Please welcome to the program, Mike Rowe. Mike, thanks for being here. Great to see you. Um, I Thank have you to me. talk about uh, before we get into the movie, which which I did see as a restorative. Uh, I want to talk a bit about your background. You grew up in Baltimore County, Maryland. Your parents, John and Peggy, were both teachers. 
Tell me about the values you learned from your folks and America at that time and how that shaped the work you would later do in this particular project. Well, it's funny, Raymond, you don't really know the answer to that question in, in real time, right? You, it's only in getting older and looking back that you can start to appreciate or at least make, make sense of the impact that your folks had on you. Uh, I grew up on a small farm uh, a little north of Baltimore County. My dad was a social studies teacher. My mom stayed at home and raised three boys. But the secret sauce and the, and the real great blessing for me was my neighbors happened to be my grandparents. And oh my it gosh. was really just us up on this hill, surrounded by mm. babbling brooks and a, and, a, and a woods and horses and a barn and so forth. So... I had, a, I had a front row seat to an extraordinary work ethic. My pop built the house I was born in without a blueprint. And, and my dad sort of inculcated into his sons a, uh, a curiosity and an understanding, really, of, of our past. And so I just grew up very fortunate with a healthy sense of curiosity and, and exposure to a pretty decent work ethic, which I hope I may have inherited somewhat. Well, and I love that your grandparents were there. I grew up with my, my great-grandmother in our home, you know, as well as my grandparents in my life. And people don't realize, I think, if you haven't had that experience, Mike, that they really become almost time travel, uh, you know, uh, talismans for you uh, in that they bring the past into stark relief into the present. And there is something wonderful about that that we may have lost in America, particularly the way we shuttle around and, and, you know, shove the elderly out of society and out of the picture, I think, too soon. I think so, too. And also, I would say that if you're if you're trying to raise your kids as a as a mom and a dad, you 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 give them lessons. Right. And you and you instill these ideas and beliefs. But if, if you have living proof next door from a prior generation. Uh, you know, my dad told me much later in life, you know, he said, I could always tell you what I believed to be true, but then we always had the proof. You know, we had the proof of humility living next to us. We, we had the proof mm -hmm. of work ethic. We had the proof of all of these virtues that mattered to my mom and dad, but they, they couldn't necessarily say, hey, look at us, we're awesome. What they right. could say is, Look at your grandparents. Look at what they've built and look mm. at what they've done and look at how respected they are and so forth. So, you know, we hear a lot about the missing dads in today's society, but, but the missing grandparents, I think, uh, are even more uh, consequential. Uh, I agree with you. And, and, Mike, you're so well known for your shows, Dirty Jobs, uh, uh, Somebody's Got to Do It. And as an advocate for good old-fashioned hard work, particularly in the world of skilled trades. How has that notion of work changed for Americans since the end of World War II to today? And uh, how does what Americans believe about their work and purpose and vocation of work impact the culture? It's a really interesting question and it, and it ties in, unfortunately, I think, to the survey that you referred to. The fact that just 25 years ago, 70% of Americans saw themselves as extremely patriotic. Well, 25, 30, 40 years ago, the majority of Americans understood the, the wonder of the vocational arts. We were, we were much more connected, I, I think, to the big things like where our food came from and where our energy comes from. And, and having that kind of awareness about how our workforce works um, makes it a lot easier to be grateful for the electrician, the steam fitter, the pipe fitter, the welder, and all mm -hmm. the various vocations that allow us to live a civilized life. When that appreciation, however, starts to erode, as it did when we took shop class out of high school, you, you get on a road to uh, just call it a lack of appreciation and all of the things mm -hmm that that ushers in, and none of it's good. And the, the link I would suggest it might exist is, is a lack of appreciation for that part of our workforce 
tied to a lack of understanding or a lack of curiosity or a similar disconnect from our actual past and yeah. understanding our past and celebrating our past, especially around Independence Day, being proud of it. Yeah, and that's a, that's a perfect bridge to your film, Something to Stand For, which uh, hits theaters uh, on June 27th, just in time for Independence Day. And the film is really, Mike, a celebration of America at a time when there is so much criticism and derision heaped upon her for events really from the past or the distant past. And it's a little bit of a mystery, a little bit of a documentary. Uh, you take nine stories that folks might not be familiar with, and through dramatizations and Man on the Street interviews, you paint a picture of America through storytelling. Now, I know you took a lot of this from your podcast, the way I heard it, because I listened to it, and, mm -hmm. um, and expanded it here. Tell me why you chose this approach, those nine vignettes particularly. Well, it really goes back about seven or eight years when I found myself listening to these old episodes of Paul Harvey doing oh, yeah. the rest of the story. I just thought that was such a fun way, you know, to turn a history lesson into a mystery and allow everybody to kind of play along. So I, I started writing stories in that style about all components of pop culture. Lots of history, obviously, uh, but it was pretty broad. And I, I wrote about 300 of them. And uh, wow. this project happened because somebody came to me and said, look, Independence Day is coming. And there is a real patriotic theme in a lot of your stories. What if you, what if you picked the nine most consequential stories about patriots, stories that most people don't know about people that we do, and strung them together with a field trip of sorts to D.C. to meet the park rangers who clean up our statuary and our monuments and our memorials. And look, no one wants a lecture, nobody wants a sermon, and no right. one wants a lesson plan. We, we want to be entertained. So my hope was to tell a series of short stories, put them together, and maybe leave the viewer and their families with, with something to chat about over the next meal. Yeah, well, that, that's such a great setup, and I want to give our viewers a glimpse of what they'll be seeing. Here's a clip from Something to Stand For. Today, people come here from all over to pay their respects. People like Andy Michael, whose daughter brought him here today. When were you in the service? Where were you? Uh, 51 to 55. I have a Jean career from March of 52 to January of 53. Well, my dad was there that same exact time. He was there in 53 and 54. So you, Small world. You weren't in the reservoir. You weren't in Chosen, were you? Oh, hell no. I didn't want to go there. Cold, man. No, no those guys, they were the heroes. Hmm. Mike, was that interview arranged ahead of time? Tell us how that came to be, and, and why was it so important to include in your mind? It's funny that you would play that. Um, you know, 99% of the movie... Uh, was scripted and planned and shot. We had 300 actors, all from Oklahoma, by the way. You know, everything about wow. the film was deliberate and intentional. But I was standing there uh, in the World War II mm -hmm. memorial setting up for a very specific planned shot. And, and I saw this old guy out of the corner of my eye in his wheelchair with half a dozen other old men. Their families had brought them, their friends. They were on one of those honor flights, you know. He was just sitting there looking at all those stars on the wall and all of the sacrifice that they represented. And I just grabbed my director and said, look, let's just go over here. I want to talk to this guy. And, uh, you know, when you have your name in the title of the movie, they have to do what you tell them, right? So, so we went over <laughs> you made and the, had You a, made the right <laughs> choice, Mike. It's a lesson from Dirty Jobs, Raymond. You know, I spent most of my career with no script. No plan, right? You know, no second takes. We we shot everything very, very, very honestly on TV. Movies are different, mm. but that one, that moment, and 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 a few others were completely unscripted. Yeah, and as as you mentioned earlier, uh, a number of of moments in the film, they're dramatizations to illustrate the stories you tell. So just to give people a fuller appreciation, I wanted them to see, as you described, this is really the heart of the movie. Watch this. These are some of the dramatization watch Williams on the other hand well he didn't have to imagine anything because he was right there to experience the reality of a 25-hour shelling up close 
and personal. And when a cannonball took his leg off above the knee, leaving him flat on his back, the runaway slave looked up from a pool of his own blood and saw the broad stripes and the bright stars of a flag that was still there, flying defiantly over his head. Yeah, it was so, that was a moving, such a moving part. There are many in this film. But, uh, Mike, for some, that clip, a runaway slave who, who's fighting in the war for independence, that's evidence of a permanently and fatally flawed nation. There are Americans who say, starting with slavery, America is inherently racist, and that it's as bad as it's ever been now. What would you say to those Americans who have that opinion and believe that? I would say that two things can be true at the same time. There is massive room for improvement. We will never be finished. We are never going to be a perfect country. Uh, we were founded by imperfect men, but they had perfect ideas. And those ideas, mm. the, the striving for them, that's that's what matters most. This in no way is this a political movie or an attempt to make some sort of apology for past mistakes. It is, however, mm -hmm. uh, a real honest attempt on my part to say, look, we have to take measure of our progress. We have to look honestly at where we were in 1776 and 1812 and 1861 and 1941. And if if we can't see the the incredible progress that that we've made, then I have to believe it's because we affirmatively don't want to look at it. And if we don't want to acknowledge our progress, well, then we're just in another situation. I, again, there is much to be done. There is much left to do. But the idea that there's nothing to be proud of or nothing to be grateful for or nothing to celebrate, well, that's crazy. Yeah. Why did you make this movie now? And who do you envision it for? Do you see this almost as a corrective for some of the revisionist, uh, ideologically distorted history that we're hearing <laughs> and seeing to a, a, a correction of the record, if you will? I, I wouldn't presume I've got the power to correct the record, but, but, I, but I would like for people to see as many sides of a thing as they can. And I think a lot of teachers or a lot of parents have been looking at what's happening in our in our schools and they see the acronyms you know they they see the crt they see the the dei and the esg and and so forth and fine let's let's look at all of it but but let's also look at the reality of who these men were who who built our country and let's let's be honest about the importance of the statuary that we have today and the monuments and the memorials and the insanity of attacking those things and judging our forefathers through today's enlightened state. Honestly, mm. Raymond, what are we what do we think our great 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 grandkids are gonna say about us two hundred and fifty right. years from now? <laughs> How, exactly. How, how will we be, re what, what, what statues will be pulled down then? What yeah. will we think of the meat eaters, <laughs> right? Yeah. 250 right. years from now, no. who knows? Presentism, presentism doesn't stop, Mike, with us. It keeps going on and on, which is that, you know, uh, belief that you judge the past by the present. This is absurd. And I, I love that your film, though, focuses on these human stories. They are, they are human people who are in struggle. And we see through their example something glorious. And look, every time I see a monument, we didn't build these monuments and our forefathers didn't build these monuments to gods. They built these monuments to broken and flawed men who may have done one, two, three great things that are worth noting. And I think sometimes we confuse the two in this present debate about what should come down or what name should be changed. We've missed the point, I think. Well, and we're, we're looking constantly, it seems, not just for something that we can all genuinely stand for, but we're also looking for things we can stand against. And, you know, the, the thing that makes us a country, the things that make us a people, um, they, they require us to have some 
uh, joint understanding of the basic facts that happened. They're, like I said, you don't, standing for the flag, standing for the national anthem, putting your hand on your heart when you recite the pledge doesn't mean you're happy with the current crop of elected officials. It doesn't mean you believe that every policy in place is good or prudent or wise. It just means that you're acknowledging we're a work in progress. National Anthem was a protest song. And before right. that, it was a drinking song. <laughs> right? I mean, it's a, there, there are just so many wonderful things to learn, to your point, about the people who yeah. got us to where we are. So to celebrate the past, to understand it, that's the goal. Well, and I love that this film does that, Mike. And what do you want people to take away from this movie? Something to stand for. And, and it hits theaters, by the way, June 27th. But what do you want them to take away from it? Well, the first thing I hope is that they're just genuinely entertained. That's the point of going mm -hmm. to the movie. Like I said, lectures mm -hmm. and lessons and sermons, you know. But right. if, I, if, I, if I could cherry pick and go beyond that, I, I think maybe a level of gratitude you know, gratitude's an interesting virtue because like, like most great virtues, you know, it's not, it's not like your hair color or your skin color or your blood type or your star sign. It's a, it's a thing you can choose. We, we can choose to be grateful. We can choose to work hard. We can choose to be patient and kind and, and all of those things. But choosing to be grateful on Independence Day, that, that's something we can all do as a country. And if we do that, who knows what else we can do together? Well, and you said it earlier, a common appreciation and understanding for the country you are part of is critical to this experiment in liberty that the founders uh, drafted all those centuries ago. And I love that this movie, Something to Stand For, reminds us of the greatness of America and the importance of unifying America and the people in America, even with our disagreements and our differences. Something to Stand For, the new movie from Micro, hits theaters for a special engagement June 27th through July 4th from Fathom Events. Visit somethingtostandfor.movie for more information and how to get tickets in your area. Mike, thanks so much for being here. Hope you come back. Anytime, Raymond. I appreciate it. <laughs> Peace activist and poet Matty Stepanek will be remembered this week at a memorial mass in his home parish in Maryland. It has been 20 years since Matty left us, but his message of peace and hope and faith remains as vital and relevant today as ever it was. Joining me now to talk about her son's lasting legacy is his mother, Dr. Jenny Stepanek. Jenny, thank you for being here. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I, you can't believe it. I can't believe that it's been 20 years since we lost Maddie. What in your estimation is his lasting legacy? And how does that legacy and message continue to grow? I, I really think his lasting legacy is as he would have said, the echo and silhouette of his life, it, that the messages of hope and peace that he shared um, were placed in his heart by God, which means they're timeless, they're universal messages. And I think that is the beautiful truth today that 20 years is an entire generation. It's a whole new group of people that are just now saying either, oh yeah, I remember him, or hmm. Maddie, who is Maddie? which you didn't hear 20 years ago. Um, so a generation later, um, one of the, the greatest things that happened in the last year is one of the Maddie Stepanek Guild directors, Keaton, she developed a virtues curricula based on Maddie's poetry and Maddie's um, life, how he role modeled, how he lived with virtues. Mm -hmm. And it was in a number of Catholic schools during the past year, uh, each one did it completely differently. They took this curricula supplement, used it in their schools in very unique ways. And we just had a webinar about that. And it's just beautiful to see children and families a generation later being inspired with these messages of hope and peace in a world that if you look at our world, you may think, our world is falling apart. And in many ways it is. The state of our world is dismal. But the truth of our world is absolutely beautiful. And Maddie is a reminder that we need to pause and 
to remember that hope is real and peace is possible and to never give up a spy for those truths. Jenny, for those who are new to Maddie, um, Maddie Stepanek at four years old, if memory serves, Jenny, that's when he started to receive what he would later call his heart songs. Tell us about that moment, the first time you saw him um, receive these messages. You had to be a little uh, concerned, uh, confused about what was happening. Absolutely. He was, he was actually about three, three and four years old. Wow. And he, I knew that Maddie was very bright. A lot of children are bright. I knew that he was reading at age three. I never taught him to read. He just somehow knew how to read. And even that, there are children who are just very talented, very gifted, very smart. But then there was something different about Maddie where he seemed to not just be intelligent, but also have this wisdom, this, this understanding. And he was very creative. After his brother Jamie died, he used poetry and short stories little essays to help him get through the grief, to talk things out. But some of the expressions that he was creating just were very, very different than what a three and four year old child would be saying. And what he said was, God is placing messages in my heart. And it's my, my purpose in this world is to choose the words to shape and share those messages with other people. So really, some of what he shared was just his insights, his experiences, what he's living and, and saying. But some of it was very, very different. And you could even see and hear that it had a different quality, a different nature to it. And he called those his heart songs. It was his purpose on earth. And I do remember being very, very concerned. Um, mm -hmm. Rev, I guess, is how I would describe it. And even calling my pastor at the time saying, do you think he's getting close to death? Because he swears he's hearing God and, and he's very, he believes this and it frightened me. And his pastor mm. said, um, he really has a foot in both worlds. He's been so close to death most of his life. And yet he's so immersed in life, all of his life, that he's got a foot in both worlds. And he said, treasure these, these, these are your grace notes, what he calls a heart song. Um, I remember actually asking him once, I said, Maddie, he's about three, maybe three and a half. And I said, Maddie, when you hear God speaking in your heart, um, is it loud? Is it soft? Is it a man's voice, a woman's voice? What is it that you're hearing? And my three and a half year old son looked at me as if I had lost my mind. And he's like, mommy, <laughs> doesn't speak to you like this. God speaks into my heart. <laughs> message and that's mm. why i'm a messenger i choose the voice i choose the words i choose how to shape mm. it and i think that's the beauty of his legacy to go back to that first question is that it is god's message that came through maddie's heart and then his hands and words so anybody that wants to take god's message today as maddie shared it it's relevant to them it is useful it mm -hmm. is inspiring and authentic yeah. and it's time and it's still alive in our world today. Yeah, well, they're so simple and yet profound and that's what makes them, I think, uh, so powerful because generations can access them. Older people can read them, children can read them and they, they, they touch you in different ways because they are true, they are authentic. Jenny, uh, there's so much going on this week. Would you tell us a little bit about the events coming up uh, to memorialize this great uh, anniversary, Maddie's 20th uh, anniversary, the 20th anniversary of his passing. First, tell us about the annual mass. Okay, so um, this Saturday, June 22nd, 2024, marks the 20 year anniversary of Maddie's passing. So the Maddie J.T. Stepanek Guild, which is a spiritual organization, it's a nonprofit, a group of people who are really gathering information about Maddie. They're gathering uh, people who knew Maddie, people who knew of Maddie, people who are just learning about Maddie today, but have something that they wanna share, something about how Maddie touches their life or inspires them to live with virtues or to think about life differently. They're gathering that information um, for, as you know, Raymond, the possible yep. cause of for Maddie to be formally recognized by the Catholic Church, maybe one of these mm -hmm. years. 
Um, so they're going to have a beautiful mass at St. Rose of Lima uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern time. People can come in person and there's going to be a beautiful reception afterwards. Or they can live stream. The link is on mattymatters.org and people can watch it live stream, stream in real time. And, and what I'm excited about is that this mass is not going to be a somber remembrance of a child who died. It is going to be an authentic celebration of a child who lived and who reminds us yeah. about the hope and peace. Um, there's children yeah. involved. Um, it's just going to be a beautiful celebration, not, not a yeah. sad, remembrance. Yeah. Well, then anybody it, who's ever seen Maddie or heard him, whether on Oprah's show or this show or, you know, in his many appearances on Larry King or on the MDA telethon, he was always such a bright light and a jolt of joy. And I love that that's the way you're mem memorializing and remembering him, but also extending his message. May I share one more event real quick before we, we end um, the, the Maddie Foundation event? So the Maddie Guild is doing the mass. Maddie's foundation, which I run, um, is his peace legacy. And on July 14th, uh, it's a Sunday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the Maddie Stoponic Park in um, Rockville, Maryland. Uh, that information will be on the website as well big party to celebrate his birthday. The Guild celebrates his anniversary. I celebrate his birthday. And so between those two events, June 22nd and July 14th, what heart song would I share? I'm gonna share with you um, the quote that I've chosen to honor his 20 year legacy as I close my remarks at the mass this Saturday. Um, in a world where we're struggling for hope, we need hope and hope is simply a reflection of God's love for us and with us that it helps move us into each next moment. The heart song for Maddie I would share is think gently, speak gently, live gently, and the world will be touched with the es essence of your existence. Well, Jenny, I always thank you for your time and, and for really embodying that ideal of speaking gently and acting gently and living gently. You've done that so beautifully. and. Uh, and, and have labored and worked so hard to extend and continue Maddie's message. It's beautiful to see. The 20th Memorial Mass for Maddie Stepanek is Saturday, June 22nd at St. Rose of Lima Parish in Germantown, Maryland. Visit maddiematters.org for more information, and then you can celebrate his birthday and legacy at Peace Day in the park, Sunday, July 14th uh, at 11 a.m. Uh, at the Maddie Stepanek Park in Rockville, Maryland. Visit MaddieOnline.com for all those details. Thank you, Jenny. God bless you. See you soon. Thank you so much. Before we go, some sad news to report. Longtime Catholic radio host and the founder of Ave Maria Radio, Al Cresta, passed away on June 15th at his home in Michigan after a battle with liver cancer. He was 72. Though baptized and raised Catholic, Al was a former evangelical Protestant pastor who began his radio career before his reversion to Catholicism in 1992. Al's voice was heard on hundreds of radio stations daily, including EWTN's radio network, via his and Ave Maria's signature program, Cresta, in the afternoon. Eternal rest grant unto Al Cresta and condolences to his family, his wife of nearly five decades, Sally, as well as his five children. He was an incredible broadcaster and a beloved part of the EWTN family who will be sorely missed. God bless you, Al. And the National Eucharistic Congress is only weeks away in Indianapolis, Indiana, on July 17th through the 21st. You can still sign up to attend. To register, visit EWTN.com forward slash Eucharist, and you'll receive a discounted pass. For those of you not in Indianapolis, if you're unable to travel, EWTN will be streaming live coverage of the National Eucharistic Congress beginning July 17th. That is all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, Thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. I know.